Welcome back to the HBO Band of Brothers podcast. This is Roger Bennett. You say flash, I say thunder. Today, our focus is episode five, Crossroads. A connective episode linking the front half of the series to the back half. It's a structurally nuanced affair, which unfolds partially in flashback and moves the men from Operation Market Garden in the Netherlands to the gruesome slog that awaits them at the Battle of the Bulge. The episode's a crossroads, not just for Easy Company, but also for its leader, our hero, Dick Winters, as we see him promoted to Battalion Commander, a move which coincides with Easy's transition from well-oiled fighting force to undersupplied, undermanned, and outgunned unit. More than any, the episode has a meta quality. By filtering the story through Winter's viewpoint to meditation on leadership, the retelling of war stories about memory, the trauma of combat, and how that trauma is processed by those who endure it. Directed by Tom Hanks himself, the episode uses a cinematic masterstroke contrasting Winters hammering the keys of his typewriter against the sound of him squeezing the trigger of his M1 Garand. Firing a shot that will stay in his mind decades later. This episode is one of the most indelible of the entire series and one that grows in meaning for me every time I watch it. All of that and a Jimmy Fallon cameo. I'll try to make another ammo run if I can, but uh, don't count on anything. My guest today is the very first person attached to the Band of Brothers project who is not a Hanks or a Spielberg. A gent who threw himself into the task of meticulously studying all things Easy Company, from primary documents and diaries to interviews with the men themselves. A process that led not just to the creation of the Band of Brothers Bible, an enormous opus that served as the formative text for the show, but also a deep, lasting friendship with the real Major Dick Winters, whose eulogy he had the privilege of delivering upon his death. We welcome to the show supervising producer, lead writer, the gent who penned episode 5, a man who's an honorary member of Easy Company via the decree of Major Winters himself, for reals, it's the one and only Mr. Eric Gendrison. Hello Roger, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a joy to be with you, let's go right back to the origin story of your connection to Band of Brothers, to borrow a line from Genesis, in the beginning, Steven Spielberg had optioned Citizen Soldiers, won Stephen Ambrose book, Tom Hanks had optioned Band of Brothers, competing projects, dueling banjos, if you will, but they thankfully united to tell the narrative of the war from training to the Eagle's Nest, and they needed a writer to do the deep research and sculpt the contours of the project. Eric, how did they choose you? I've gleaned since that it goes back to a feature screenplay I'd written that Gary Getzman, who ran Playtone, still does, he had read a feature screenplay of mine about Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. The author of The Little Prince. Those were my bona fides for this. And I was contacted then by my agent who sent me the book and I read it. I was actually in the midst of a production of a play of mine in Philadelphia. And this was in the fall of 1998. And Diana Choi from Playtone flew out to meet with me. And we sat and talked so long that she missed her train to the airport, actually. <laughs> Subsequently, really, I just sat with the story and broke it down into 13 episodes and figured out what the episode breaks were. And then I came out to Hollywood and I met with Tom in his trailer. He was shooting the Green Mile at the time. 
And I told him what my breakdown was. And he and I independently had broken it down in exactly the same fashion, which was kind of wonderful. And then I met with Stephen. And the next thing I knew, I was at the beginning on the threshold of a life-changing experience. Your starting point, obviously, Ambrose's original book, Band of Brothers, which you loved. But in reading it, you realized a lot was missing. Yes, yes, indeed. I mean, Ambrose was a master of writing populist history, as opposed to the rigor of a academic historian. And it was a compelling story, but obviously there was a lot missing. So the next step was to meet with Major Winters himself. And that's really what changed everything. Hershey, Pennsylvania, where Major Richard Winters had retired. And his house, you've described it as akin to a little easy company museum. Can you take us there? Charming little house in Hershey. The Sanctum Sanctorum was upstairs. After we had a little lunch, we went up those stairs. On the landing, you turn to your right, and here is this little office of his, and it really was an archive. And there were filing cabinets and his desk and a comfortable chair in the corner, and he motioned for me to sit down. But before I did, I noticed that there was something behind the chair, and I said, are, are, is, are these what I think they are? And he said, yes. I said, may I? And I picked up his corker and jump boots. And he watched me as I looked for the little shrapnel hole that I knew would be there. <laughs> <laughs> because it was really all about Winters assessing me. This was a pro move to prove your bona fides. But then he made it really specific because we sat down and he said, I want you to look at this. And he slid a letter across the table. He said, I'd like you to read that. And it was a letter from Shifty Power's daughter to Winters asking what on earth could we do? Because in Ambrose's book, Ambrose had mistakenly blamed Shifty for something. It was a dereliction of duty issue during the Battle of the Bulge. Shifty was just destroyed by this. So he watched me keenly as I was reading this letter. As I got to the end of the letter and I handed it back to him, and he said, what do you think of that? And I said, well, I guess that's our first order of business to correct that. And then we were off. He created three sets of five very thick binders in which he had created essentially his own personal scrapbook, his journal entries, everything you could imagine for each of the campaigns. And he had given one to Ambrose. He had one for the family and he had kept a third set because he said he knew someday somebody like me was going to be walking through his door. And so began an extraordinary friendship built over three years plus of daily conversations between you and Dick Winters, of which you've said was life-changing for both of you. As I told my wife when I came back from that first meeting, I think I've just met the most balanced man I've ever met. And our relationship would develop over years into a truly profound friendship. We became very, very close. Keep in mind, during the crafting of the Bible, I had daily questions, digging deeper and deeper and deeper into his memory. You can imagine that here I am on a daily basis talking to this gentleman about these events, and he is feeling the responsibility of getting it right as well, as he always put it, fact positive. <laughs> By virtue of that experience, it was almost really like a very intensive therapy session for him every day. And it went deeper and deeper and deeper. And so the trust that we developed was quite remarkable. There wouldn't be a day that would go by that I wouldn't call him up and read something that I'd written, even in the Bible, to get his approval or his thoughts about. I love this detail. You never called him Dick. He never called you Eric. No, it was always Winters and Genderson. Always. <laughs> and I found this very moving. Your story that the first time you left Winters home and took off on your flight, you looked down at Hershey below you and you realized, well, you tell us what you realized. Looking down at the lush vegetation in Hershey and I just had this realization that I've just met a man who's going to change my life. And one day I'm going to have to say goodbye to him. And I realized that all in the same moment. And thus you began to recreate the easy company narrative from the beginning of training to the end of the war. And I love the way you described your modus, your sense of mission, and the weight of responsibility you felt. You said, my goal was to serve the experience. This is something that Tom and I embraced from the very beginning. We were going to set the bar at an impossibly high level because it always falls. These guys didn't suffer fools and they didn't suffer exaggeration. And 
the sheer strength of character of these men is something that, to a man, impressed and inspired everybody who worked on this project. How often, as a storyteller, do you get to be able to interact with true characters like these men and to serve their story? It was exhilarating. And the idea of getting it right was nothing but rocket fuel. We really determined to go for broke and allow the truth to guide the drama. That's what I tried to tackle in the Bible, is to get every detail exactly right. Details about the character of these men, the anecdotal stuff, and the technical stuff. We were in a unique situation, thanks to HBO's decision to give Tom and Playtone and the creative team an absolute carte blanche, to the extent to which HBO never, never gave us one single note. <laughs> That's incredible. Zero notes. For everybody involved in this endeavor, certainly for all the writers where it begins, for John Orloff and Bruce McKenna and E. Max Fry and Grant Yost and Eric Bork and Tom himself, they all became infected by the same thing that had infected me, an understanding of the extraordinary responsibility of telling this story and serving the experience of the men. Listening to that, it's easy to glimpse the signature of the success of the show, that goal to almost de John wayne warfare. Absolutely. We were taking huge chances here. We wanted to tell a story of war, warts and all, as it had never been told before, cinematically, as it had never been told before. And we didn't need to avoid the tropes because we were dealing with the real thing. All you had to do is get out of the way and make sure you didn't make it silly. I mean, it, it just had to get out of the way and let it tell itself. And always keeping in mind that it was about serving their story. It was about serving their experience and their intention. I love this line of yours, Eric. This was the most egoless production in Hollywood history. It sounds almost oxymoronic. <laughs> it is indeed. It is indeed. I don't know if it'll ever be recreated. Subsequently, I don't think I've ever had a creative meeting in Hollywood about anything that doesn't begin with whoever I'm meeting with asking me about Band of Brothers and how that happened. And I always tell them the same thing. I tell them that HBO made this decision and they weren't going to give us any notes and we knew best and that's how it happened. And there's always a moment of silence that follows that. And the response is always the same. Well, that'll never happen again. <laughs> <laughs> but I just explained to you how it happened and why it ended up being something different. God love Hollywood. The only place where they watch Band of Brothers and the takeaway from it is what? Zero notes. The rest of us are just absolutely captivated. So let's dive into episode five. You were supervising producer and lead writer. So you're able to choose exactly which episodes you wanted the script. You chose episodes one, five and ten. The first, the middle, the last. What about this one drew you to it? Something really unique about episode five for me. Five was the most important to me because of my friendship with Winters and because this was really the crossroads of his life. The events of October 5th changed his life forever. And the experience of October 5th in discussing it back when we were just working on the Bible was the first time that I ever saw or experienced Major Winters become overcome by emotion. And it moved him so deeply, which really surprised me because it was the first time I'd really seen him or experienced him become emotional. And I didn't feel like anybody could shoulder that responsibility but me. Directed by one Tom Hanks, Captain Miller himself. Hanks executive produced the entire series. And of all the episodes he could have directed, he chose this one. Can you talk about your writer-director partnership and how it worked? It was the simplest you could possibly imagine. I wrote the script. The first draft had a slightly different approach than the second draft, which was the one we shot. Structurally, it had a different conceit. And it was only after talking to Tom that we really discovered what it should be and realizing how we could use the typewriter keys and counterpoint to the gunfire to manufacture a story that really was about processing trauma. I wrote that and I went and met with Tom and he was shooting Castaway at the time. And I remember him coming out of the room. He had his beard and his hair was all over the place. And he just came over and threw his arms around me and gave me a big bear hug. And he said, we've got this one. And that was the relationship because it was Tom. We'd been working on this at that point for a couple of years. And I left it all on the page for him. And I knew that he'd do it up smartly. He even makes a cameo in the episode. Yes, he does. 
in the scene where the Red Devils are celebrating after Easy brings them back over the river. Glimpse Hanks. It's definitely a top 10 Hanks role. But episode 5 opens. Eric, an incredible opening scene. A magnificent swirling set piece. A running shot. Heavy breathing. Galloping footsteps. A close-up of a bayonet. Winter storming a crossroad seemingly solo. Charges above an embankment. Confronts an unarmed young German lying impotently in the grass. For a second, the two lock eyes. An incredibly powerful moment. You see briefly the humanity of both men laid bare. It's almost as if you are reminding us that these men may be on opposing sides of war, but they are living, breathing human beings. Indeed. And the memory of that moment changed Winter's life. I really believe it was the fulcrum on which the rest of his life was balanced. He was never able to get out of his mind and his memory the look on that young boy's face. That nanosecond, that moment when he pulled the trigger and saw him fall, he was not afforded any opportunity to reflect on it at the time because there was an entire company of SS troops over to his right, and he just turned and standing there by himself emptied his M1 Garand clip at a massive number of soldiers. And then the rest of the company comes in, and it was only really afterwards that he was able to reflect and go back to that moment and question, did he have a choice? Could he have spared the boy's life? Of course he couldn't, but the truth of the horror of war, what it does to boys and what it does to men, it was captured for him in that instant of time. The instant after this, he loses the company. Everything changes. It is that crossroads, it's that nexus. And he has to deal with the loss of the command of his company in order to take over the command of the battalion. After the shooting, we jump forward to camp, where Winters gets Nixon out of bed, dumping a picture of his own urine on him. Oh, that's my own piss, for Christ's sake! The number one question everyone has about Band of Brothers, does Winters know what's in the picture before he pours? He didn't. He had no idea. And Winters had one of the most robust laughs I've ever heard. <laughs> and I can still hear him chuckling about that. It's one of his favourite memories <laughs> of the entire war and certainly his friendship with Nixon. I do love Captain Nixon's advice on how to write a good report. Dick, you know, that's not literature. You just keep it simple. Try writing the first person plural, you know, say we a lot. But Winters was not just writing any report. He was distilling a truly traumatic moment, that combat report of the action from the show open 12 days earlier on the south side of the dike near Ranvik. I'm fascinated though by the time jumps which make the episode feel reflective. What was the thought process behind playing with time, that decision? Having experienced Winter's deep emotional connection to these events, the opportunity to tell a story, partly a story about a man remembering and trying to serve and confront a traumatic event and to struggle with the emotional impact of something that changed his life. It was an unusual opportunity to craft into the narrative the basic relationship and the dynamic between Winters and myself, because that's what we were all about. We were trying desperately to put onto paper what had happened and to serve the experience and to serve the truth and to make it fact positive. It was sort of a microcosmic cinematic symbol of our relationship, trying to commit these memories to paper and to do it right. We're back in the field. Winter's position's first squad to take out the visible German soldiers. This is our fallback position, here. Mortars deploy here. First squad on me. Go! Which soon spirals into a kinetic quick cut of mortar rounds, suppressing fire. The bullets and the typewriter keys continuing to play off each other as we ricochet between past and present. Winters has no idea at all how many Germans are positioned above them, could be as many as a battalion in his mind. It all begins with something that's easily overlooked. It certainly wasn't for Winters, and he would laugh at the memory of giving one of the rarest commands in the European theater of operation. Fix bayonets. Fix bayonets. It, it never happened. It was so uncommon, but he didn't have a choice. And he talked to me about the reaction of the men in the ditch, kind of a come again. Are you serious? <laughs> it's going to be that bad. It's going to be that close. That is echoes of the Somme. That is First World War trench war darkness. 
steely grimaces, pursed lips all round. Then that canister of red smoke unleashed. Winters takes off before his men, leading from the front as usual. Winters had taken to heart the Fort Benning slogan of follow me. It wasn't just about follow me into that hedgerow, follow me across this field. It was about follow my example and we'll get through this and we will succeed. And that whole follow me notion is exactly how he led. This is the guy who would get up before Reveille and run up Curahy and down, three miles up and three miles down, all by himself, just to do it. The fact that the men witnessed this, that caused them all to say, hell yes, when he said, follow me, because this was a guy who knew where he was going. Nothing was going to stop him. It's the apotheosis of leadership, as far as I'm concerned. That follow me value, which is such a core of the entire Band of Brothers show, it's a value that you, Eric, have said you came to learn was embedded across that entire generation? Without question. You're dealing with a different breed of sons and daughters of the Depression to begin with, who were asked to go over there and to breach Hitler's fortress Europa and to make the world safe for democracy, to rid the world of fascism. And they believed deeply in what they were doing. They understood it because it was that simple to them experientially. For the paratroopers, a lot of them were paratroopers simply because of the extra $50 in jump pay. But for most of those guys, if you talk to them about it, when they made that decision, they realized that this experimental group of paratroopers, this unique division that was being created, was going to require the best of the best. And they wanted to be able to look up to the man standing next to them. Krauts in the open, fire for effect. It turns out the men have attacked two entire crack SS companies, a turkey shoot in shoes. Stephen Ambrose wrote, easy put out more energy than a heavyweight boxer in a 15 round title match. And as you say, it all comes from Winters leading by example to initiate all that followed. Reinforce easy at phase line yellow, plus one, strike three, fire concentration Charlie. Drop. I have to say, Damien Lewis is magnificent in this episode. What made it clear that it had to be him for the part? He is a force to be reckoned with. And to answer your question, I think what makes Damien so right for this part to play Winters is that the two of them have something in common. An alpha male doesn't need to behave like an alpha male. A true alpha doesn't act alpha. Winters never did, certainly. There's a quiet, profound presence to the guy that I think causes men to line up around him like metal filings around a magnetic field. It speaks for itself. And I think the analog for that is screen presence, <laughs> which Damien has in spades. You can't take your eyes off the guy. There's something that draws you to that quiet, that stillness. That is something that it's ineffable. And both men had it. Damien had that presence on screen and Winters had it in the field. You know both men, Eric, Winters and Damien Lewis. How close was the actual portrayal to the real thing, charisma aside? It was stunningly close. I don't think these two men are a lot alike in temperament, but Damien really led the way in serving who Winters was rather than putting his own fingerprints on the character. He understood who he was. It's a real challenge for an actor to play a man that many would see as Teflon. Nothing touches this guy. Everything he does is right. How do you play that? It's not interesting. So many actors would say, where are the flaws in this guy? Damien never went there. He understood it. He got it from jump. And inarguably, it's the hardest role in the series. It's very, very difficult to play an Ubermensch. <laughs> <laughs> As the smoke literally clears on the battlefield, there's one American fatality, just 22 Americans injured. But there's also an overhanging awareness and a lack of intel before the maneuver. There's almost a sense of foreboding, Eric, that for all of Winter's courage, it could all have gone a completely different way. And many more men, including Winter's, could have lost their lives. Yes, indeed. And I think that's something that Tom really captured in crafting this dramatically. The moments on October 17th when he's in front of the typewriter 
and those introspective moments. We only know that Winter survived. The fact that they lost Dukeman, and that was the only fatality, is truly remarkable. It was a remarkable feat of arms. One small detail I do love, Private David Webster, who'd left Harvard to join the paratroopers and had established himself as a thinker, a philosopher, a writer. I will be honest, I do love him. Regretting his instinctive reaction to being shot. They got me. You believe that? You believe I said that? A writer editing his own words, mourning his use of cliche. It was, uh, I mean... <laughs> Essentially, the only cliche, I think, in the entire series is commented upon <laughs> moments after it's uttered. That's a gift that we'll never stop giving. It's one of my favorite moments in the series. Winters is promoted by Colonel Sink to Battalion Executive Officer, a promotion he politely parries. Well, I know I could handle them in the field, sir. That's right, Dick. You're a solid tactician and a good leader. Don't worry about administration. As he looks over at his men, knowing in that second he's going to be even further away from them. It was really tough for him, and we captured it. There's no dramatic contrivance there. It wasn't a tough decision because he wasn't given the choice. He just had to reckon with the consequences. And one of the things that I really love about the way Tom shot it and the way it's edited is that we really have two moments of that reflection. One there at the dike when he looks and sees his beloved Easy Company just being themselves. And then one moment at the end when he's watching them walk by him into hell. Our episode pivots. Winters has been firmly positioned as a cog in the army bureaucracy, a cog with an office and an orderly of his own. Nixon presents him with or really forces him to take a 48 hour pass to Paris, Q Eiffel Tower, French sidewalk cafes, tiny coffees and lots of French people with exaggerated Euro hand gestures. But just when we think we're being treated to a pilot of some spin-off series, Winters in Paris, the tone just goes dark on us, riding on that metro alone. Winters sees a street kid and his face momentarily transforms into that of the Germany killed at the crossroad. Winters talked to me a lot about how aimless he was in Paris. He just did not know what to do with himself. He was struggling with what had happened on October 5th. He was struggling with the loss of the company. He didn't drink, he didn't smoke. Paris did not present to him the same kind of allure that it did to, I think, most of the men. And what he encountered, what was most stunning to him was the reminder of the home front, the reminder of civilian life, what they're doing this for. Riding a metro with old people, young people trying to get on with their lives, that's profound. This thematic of trauma came from your experience talking to the men of Easy Company back in the 90s and how hard it was for them initially, even to talk about what they had done, to find the words, the sons of the depression who had been thrown into a foreign reality where they experienced horrors, atrocities, the likes we couldn't imagine. And once they were back home, they could never explain it. They had no frame of reference to compare it to. And so they'd almost fallen silent post-war. That's precisely right. And... It was really all about frame of reference. Where do we begin to tell what happened for all of these men when they came home? How do you explain this to Aunt Edna in Frederick, Oklahoma? How do you explain what you saw the Germans doing to dead paratroopers on D-Day? How do you begin to do that? How do you begin to explain what was discovered in the forest of Landsberg? There's no frame of reference. And one of the if not the single most important thing about the series for me, is that at a critical moment in the lives of these gentlemen, from so many who served in the ETO, first of all came Saving Private Ryan, and then we came along afterwards, and there was a frame of reference. So the tens of thousands of grandfathers who were able to surprise the hell out of their families by saying, I'm going to tell you about what I did during the war, because now I can, because you've seen that. Now, let me explain what my part in that was. And for so many of these families, they had no idea that grandpa was even in the war. 
but they were able finally, finally at the 11th hour of their lives to be able to talk about and to have been a part of crafting a story that facilitated that catharsis. That's what it's all about. That's what I'm most grateful for. To be clear, most of the men you interviewed, most of them had combat trauma untreated and left simmering. And you, you bait that into this episode with Nixon's drinking or Buck Compton being a shell of himself after returning from hospital. And it's almost as if Saving Private Ryan had cracked open the memories of a lot of these aging veterans. You once said, band the brothers, kick that door in. I think it did. And it's interesting about the men of Easy Company. When I talk to them and when the other writers develop their relationships with their principal characters for their episodes, they did have the benefit of having already had the book come out. As far as carrying trauma is concerned, it was fascinating to me that they avoided talking about their own, what they carried with them, and they would always deflect that conversation into talking about somebody who had been lost. And where that all came together for me was a late night conversation that I had working on the Bible with Babe Heffron. I asked him, did he know of any of the men who were really suffering from combat fatigue or combat trauma? And he proceeded to tell me that I was talking to one. And he then proceeded to tell me that four to five days a week for the rest of his life and in the present, he would wake up in a cold sweat or crying or screaming because he was reliving the same event over and over and over again, which was the death of his friend Joe Campbell on the dike on October 4th, when little Babe Heffron was carrying a 20 caliber machine gun on his shoulder. And Campbell said, here, Babe, let me take that. And he hefted it onto his shoulder and he ran up to the top of the dike and took an 88 artillery shell and atomized him in front of Babe. And had he not tried to help his buddy, it never would have happened. And so Campbell's death was a current and present trauma for Babe until his death. And Lewis captures here the trauma, the disconnect with civilian life. It's almost as if on the battlefield, he can keep it together. But shorn of that role, Eric, those life and death obligations, winter's phrase. That's true. He's also been yanked out of doing his job. And he was so focused on doing his job. That's what he was there to do. In the same way that on D-Day, he had an objective and nothing was going to stop him from getting to that objective, whether he was armed with just a canteen and a trench knife. And to be jerked out of that and to be wandering the streets of Paris with essentially nothing to do and not being interested in any of that. He had a job to do and he was trying to get it done. And it was a massive interruption for him. By virtue of it being an interruption was a moment of stillness and quiet at which point what inevitably happens. All of the things that you haven't dealt with come crashing in. And really the only thing that he remembered fondly about Paris was taking that bath. He never looks more English, Damien Lewis, I have to say that. <laughs> Lewis can do an American accent in a way most English people can't, but my God, there's no hiding that, Eric, that white pasty body. That screams English in that moment. And the rest of the episode positions easy for all that's to come in the series, but it does it in a truly human way. We are back with the men in the field theatre, watching Seven Sinners, the 1940 John Wayne film, allowing you to hint at the gulf between Hollywood's telling of war stories and the realities of war. How did you choose that movie? That was the movie that the guys were watching. That's incredible. I thought there'd be a process around the table where you all just brought in a dozen war movies that were just utterly ridiculous and contrasted perfectly to the true heroism of your men in this moment. But no, no, you were just serving the truth. That's the way we rolled. And again, it's one of those things. Just get out of the way of the story because it's all there. It's all there. Amazing. The movie is interrupted by a tech corporal. of the 1st and the 6th SS Panzer Division have broken through in the Ardennes Forest. Now, they've overrun the 28th Infantry and elements of the 4th. All officers report to respective HQs. All passes are cancelled. No! Enlisted men report to barracks with the two leaders. And so begins 
the long march towards Baston that breaks open Band of Brothers' second half. The men are ill-equipped, no cold weather clothing, not enough ammo, a predicament that's exposed as they ready themselves to enter Belgium and encounter the horror of a column of retreating American soldiers, heavily injured, shell-shocked, a broken zombie army. Get out. Hey, what happened? Where are you going? They came out of nowhere. They slaughtered us. In that moment, Eric, Easy Company can't compute what they're witnessing. There's something very simple, and that is that none of these men had ever witnessed American soldiers in retreat. It was astonishing to them, and especially to paratroopers. It's all about going forward. It's always about going forward. And it took them a while to understand what they were actually witnessing. What the hell could possibly be out there that GIs were retreating from? It didn't make any sense to him. I really do think it was Garnier who started stripping them of ammo. Hey, come on. Hey, who's got ammo? Got ammo? ammo? Hold on. Give me your ammo. Who's got ammo? You got, kid? You got any grenades? Our guys start scrounging ammo and grenades from their defeated counterparts. Enter Jimmy Bloody Fallon. Well, I heard you guys are coming in. It was an ammo dump, so here. Lieutenant Rice in a jeep. Loaded with ammo, his role is brief, great fodder for Band of Brothers devotees on Reddit, but really it sets up one of the greatest lines in the series. Panzer Division is about to cut the road south. Give me a hit. Looks like you guys are going to be surrounded. We're paratroopers, Lieutenant. We're supposed to be surrounded. Yes, indeed. And I will never forget the moment when Winters told me about that. I was still working on the Bible, and I was in my kitchen, sitting at the kitchen table in Charlotte, North Carolina at the time. He was in Hershey. We were on the phone. And we were talking about that crossroads and what it looked like, all the specifics, pouring out the gasoline and setting the gasoline on fire to light the scene and how cold it was and where was Strayer. And then he told me about Rice, who drove up and who had the wherewithal to think of them and to make that trip. And he was throwing the ammo cases out and he started laughing when he was describing this kid. He said, I just remember him telling us we were essentially screwed. They were cutting the roads and we were gonna be surrounded any minute. And he just kept laughing. I said, what's so funny? He said, well, we're supposed to be surrounded. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> he said, we're paratroopers. We're supposed to be surrounded. The last scene is incredibly moving. Easy company marching snow and fire in silence, weighed down but sure-footed towards Baston. Winters wants so badly to be with his men, but knows this is the moment they will enter battle for the first time without him. And in that moment, when I watch, I realise this episode, it's about leadership. Yes, but the flip side of that coin is that it's also an episode about loneliness, Winters' loneliness. Absolutely, 100%. That fellowship, is remarkable. That brotherhood, that fraternity, the bonds that had been crafted between those men of Easy Company by this time, by December 17th, 1944, from Tekoa all the way to this moment, so profound. And for Winters, when they're marching into something that is this howling unknown that other GIs are retreating from, for him to know that he won't be there to lead those men was a profoundly lonely moment for him. The loneliness of leadership, it's a cliche, but it's absolutely true and earned, especially when the bonds are that deep and that profound. The end cards of the show, Eric, are amazing. They read, Easy Company moved into the woods near Baston. Without any artillery or air support, it was short of food, ammunition and lack winter clothing. But you end with a line from the Currahee scrapbook of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment. Along with those binders that Winters gifted to me, he gave me his Curry scrapbook once the Bible was done, gifted it to me, his own copy of it. And this can be found there. Farthest from your mind is the thought of falling back. In fact, it isn't there at all. And so you dig your hole carefully and deep and wait. Band of Brothers gets better with every viewing. Why is this? The story of Easy Company is a story of valor and strength of character and leadership. And I think in the years subsequent, we have seen a 
steady decline and decay in a lot of those qualities in society. So it becomes a stark reminder, and it's something that I think we're also drawn toward in an aspirational way for a time in which there were men and women like this who had these kinds of qualities. As for Winters and your friendship, at the end, he made you an honorary member of Easy Company. He pinned the company's jump wings on you. As a writer, you had worked so bloody hard to serve the truth. Was there some affirmation in that moment about how he had served the truth? Without question, it was affirmation from him. He was tremendously proud of what we accomplished together. He was tremendously proud of the end product. He was very impressed at the standard of excellence. He felt that the series reflected his standards, and that meant the world to him because there weren't any standards higher. And he deeply, deeply appreciated it. At the end of the day, we had, in fact, served the men whom he commanded and had the honor to lead. And Eric, sadly, you were right that day when you looked at Hershey after meeting Winters for the first time. And the thought hit you that one day you would return to bury him. In 2011, not only did you do that, but you were asked to eulogize him. And you called him, as you said, the most balanced man you've ever met. And your eulogy, which is beautiful, it's centered on Winter's trademark three-word sign-off to you. After every single session we had, after every fact-based, grueling examination of what had happened and what it meant to the men and what their experiences had been, because it was always about the men, it was never about him, ever. We always signed off the same way. I'd say, I'll write some of this up. I'll give you a call tomorrow. I'll talk to you after lunch. I'll talk to you tomorrow evening. And he always said the same thing. I'll be here. And hearing those words from a man like Dick Winters, the most reassuring words anybody could ever want to hear. I'll be here. And I felt that he would be, as would the men of Easy Company be here in this country, along with all they represented, as long as we remembered them. I'll be here. Eric Jenderson, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for doing this. You're continuing the mission of serving the story of these men, and I appreciate it deeply. What a joy to hear from Eric, a man who sat in Dick Winter's inner sanctum and plotted this wondrous series episode by episode. And coming up next, we follow Easy Company into the hellscape that is Baston, where amid savage conditions and surrounded by death, we are given one of Band of Brothers' tenderest episodes. But your touch calms people. That's a gift from God. No, it's not a gift. God would never give such a painful thing. Yes, we will hear from the man who portrayed that empathetic healer, Doc Eugene Rowe, the one and only Shane Taylor, who provides insight about what drew him initially to play the Cajun medic. There was a purity about it, and I just love the idea of somebody trying to save lives in a theatre of war, you know. Make sure to subscribe to HBO's official Band of Brothers podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And please rate, review and share. It helps more than I can say. And a reminder, you can watch Crossroads and every single episode of that masterpiece Band of Brothers on HBO Max right now. Until next time. Hooray! Hooray!